factors and the existence of either fixed factors. We seem to have understood that properly in the Cobb Douglas formulation, other formulation for cost for decreasing returns. We model that. But you see, modeling it in that way and not understanding that it's a simplification has led us not to understand that instead of increasing returns, it's not a matter of changing the sum of alpha, beta, gamma in the production function, but it's the fact of treating two inputs as the same, even if they're different and it's a different technology. Let me use my example of the tree. Do you, do you understand what I just said? Yeah. I know you do. <laughs> Sorry, boss. <laughs> uh, I'm telling you things you already know, but uh, do you understand what I just said? Tech constant return to scale is not an assumption. You know, I, I hate when people say, let me assume constant return to scale. What do you mean, you assume? There is a proper specified technology as constant return to scale. And if you want to deviate from cost of return to scale, it's because for some analytical purpose, we want to take a certain simplification. We want to mix inputs together and treat them as fine. That's, that's quite fine. I, you know, I'm not here to object to using aggregate production function. I've used them in dozens of papers. Uh, but one has to be careful of what it does in the implication. So cost of return to scale come out, obviously, because you truncate and then you say, well, let's go along some dimension after the truncation and allow substitutability so to the extent that I allow for a bit of substitutability we will see in a moment how to do it with CES <clears throat> okay then uh, we will uh, uh, observe decreasing return to scale on the other hand increasing return to scale I repeat what I just said is often modeled as the reverse of decreasing in decreasing return to scale you fix a coefficient, then the exponent of the production function add up to a number less than one. Because typically people use, unfortunately, variation of Cobb Douglas, right? That's what you do, right? You write something like this. Right? And then you say the sum And you call that decreasing return to scale. Okay? And then you say there is increasing in return to scale, and you do that. Okay? Mm -hmm. But I say, ah, <clears throat> let me give you an example of increasing return to scale 3x. Boiling 3x. Inputs. Ah, uh, and and the water. I don't know. Go go go. One liter. Okay. That's the input. Right. Then let's ask how do we boil six eggs? Well, one way is this. <coughs> right? Replication. So I'm here, I go here. Constant return to scale, right? A second way is this. Oops. Much bigger pot much bigger fire, right? If I now look at this, it says, oh, increasing returns, right? I got six boiled eggs with less total fire and less aluminum or steel in the pot, right? 
Do you agree? agree? That's actually the classical description of the crazy returns. People use it for ship containers, or all kind of things, airplanes, buses. Right? If we go from a bike to a bus, or from a car to a bus, what are we doing? Increase the returns or technological change? Technology. Here too. You gotta invent the damn port. You gotta invent the damn fire. Eh? McDonald, compared to Mom Kitchen, is not increasing return. It's technological change. McDonald or the cafeteria at the university. We're talking about that today with Legion at lunch. It says, you know. In fact, we have a theory. It's not really a theory. We think it's an observation on which we're trying to work, which is if I look over the history of humanity, everywhere, essentially along each line of production, more efficient technologies tend to have bigger size, bigger minimum size. Okay? If, as production, I'm sorry, as production, as, as production became more efficient and we invented new technologies to do the same things as before but a lower cost, we typically did it at a bigger size. Pretty much in every sector. I find it very hard to find counterexample. In fact, we couldn't. A stable counterexample really did not exist. This is, does not mean that every new firm, every innovative firm is born very big. But it means that the successful one, the efficient one, grows very big. So Apple was, <laughs> was born very small, so was Google, so were, but they've very fast grown very big. And you know, if you think of the big technological innovation that changed transportation for humanity in the, in the end of the 19th century, cars. Cars replaced horses. But even at the beginning, the first car companies were much bigger size than the horse companies. And now I've grown to, you know, if you look at the evolution of the car industry worldwide, the minimum size, the efficient size keeps growing. Which is, in fact, why we are going right now through a process, another wave of merging of car companies across the world, because the minimum size has become really much bigger and so on. But that's technological change. That's not increasing returns. If you want to describe it as increasing returns, please do it. It may be useful sometime, but then you need to be careful because, as you know, if I model a world with increasing returns and I take it seriously, then I have problem to explain how in a world like that I can have competitive equilibrium. In fact, I have a hard time explaining how in a world like that I may have competition of almost any kind. Because in a world with that technology at the aggregate level, the tendency is to have an efficient allocation with just one third. If increasing returns are global. Correct? And so one has to be careful to use the simplification. It may be useful if you're telling a story <laughs> at dinner, but if you're doing an analytical thing, jumping to the conclusion and confusing technological change with increased return and jumping to the conclusion that then you need all this and that regulation because marginal cost pricing would not work just to say one thing, is dangerous. Okay, we'll go on, if you don't mind, for uh, 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 until, uh, until 4.30 and then, uh, and then we'll take a break. Alright, so this is very important, okay, as a contribution of von Neumann model of growth. It makes you clearly separate what's technological change from what's scarcity of resources, in fact resources are bounded, and therefore sometimes production and growth is limited by the fact that some essential resources are bounded and they cannot be accumulated in the time horizon that you care about. So replication implies 
beautiful chalk. Let me use it. <laughs> Replication implies constant return to scale. Uh, reproducibility implies growth if all essential inputs are reproducible. So this last R is an abbreviation of reproducible, okay? So the replication argument, the fact that you can replicate an activity, means the constant return to scale follows is an implication of a proper description of an activity, okay? The fact that Resources, inputs and outputs are repro inputs are reproducible as outputs. Okay? You can make children, you can make new cars, you can make new computers, more computers. Okay? It implies that you can have growth if and only if all resources, all sorry, all essential inputs are also reproducible. If some essential input is not reproducible, then we will see. It's not obvious. Okay? Uh, no, you're confused. I can see from your face you don't believe me. Sure. And maybe you too, who knows? You see does. You don't like to put that eye point to go. Well, so maybe you are. How about you? You with me? What's my name? <laughs> my name. Poultry, that's good. <laughs> yeah. so then you are with me. And we are in the city of? Uh, oh, wow, good. <laughs> We're definitely, we definitely all together. All right. Um, I have a question. Go ahead. So, uh, so in this uh, boiling egg uh, example, you need those inputs, but also you need, uh, one of the input is the idea how to put them together. Oh, the, very so good. What's it, the idea of putting it together? So, uh, I am tempted to postpone that, but I'm okay. happy to discuss it now. Shall we? Let's discuss it. Let me finish. Okay, sure. Yeah, let me finish and... and I guess, and, yeah, I, as my current question, whether I should put that idea as an, an input or something different. It's an input. I'm going to try to argue that the only proper way to handle that is to treat it as an input, uh, and, and, and we will see how. I, I, I will argue how to measure it. Uh, Unless we decide to end up with metaphysics, but then we might as well assume God and, and close the door but to it, economics and just go like home. This is a re replication thing. So now I have idea how to you know how to boil three eggs, but uh, so if it's replicable, I know I, I can double every input and make six eggs. But but that requires that I have the knowledge of rep replication. So Absolutely. If you remember, in my list, in my initial list, then I didn't put it on the blackboard, I also said <coughs> there is a certain amount of time of the person cooking. And that person cooking main is an input of production, not only because that person exists, but that because that person embodies the knowledge of cooking. Exactly why today what we're doing, for good or for bad, I hope for good, <laughs> we are reproducing me. Well, part of me. Okay, we're reproducing a piece of, we're making copies if I'm successful, and when you teach, you do the same for you, right? When, when you teach, you're making copies of you, or part of you. you. You're making copies in the people's brain of what your brain knows. And that's a very, I will get to that later when we'll discuss so-called new growth theory or the issues related to the strange ideas of and confused idea of Romers and company, uh, because I will try to argue that that's exactly the best example of the fact that ideas are not public goods. In fact, 
Just to give a simple example. Well, look at what I'm doing. I am consuming your time, resources, and even my time to make copies of an idea that is a century old. And so it should be a complete free good that everybody knows, according to dominant theory. How do you know? No, no. Hey, you understand what we're doing? We're just making copies of ideas. We're usable copies. The abstract idea of uh, <laughs> von Neumann Ray uh, exists in some Confucian or, or Platonic, or, or you choose your religion, your metaphysics, hyper Iranian, but who cares? The only usable version of that is the one in my brain, your brain, his brain, her brain, his brain, right? And we're making copies. We could be making copies of sandwiches, we could make copies of shoes, we're making copies of ideas. And it takes resources, damn it. It takes time, it takes effort. It takes even me bothering them and saying, are you sure you understood? Because it's not obvious we understand. I didn't understand it the first time it was explained to me. 40 years ago, I said, what are you talking about? And Lionel started reading his joke and said, okay, let's do it again. Okay? <clears throat> yeah, so but we'll get to that because I think that's quite important. So yes, embodied, my, my point is all useful ideas are embodied in something valuable and in short supply, therefore scarce. And the ideas that are used in production are ideas that can be reproduced by making copies. You can teach me the stuff you do. I can teach you the stuff I do. <clears throat> so this and that. And now <clears throat> let's look at a little perturbation of that. Somebody arrives and says, look, I actually have a different ways of making those eggs. It's this. It's called activity A1. Uses input x of A prime and gives you a combination of output y of A prime. And then a third character comes around and says, oh, I have actually a, it's another one, this. It uses input x of A prime prime and it provides you output y of a prime prime. And both this and that, by definition, allows for reproducibility. Mm -hmm. So there are three for Neumann rays. Mm -hmm. I am famous for being completely unable to draw straight lines. <clears throat> and I'm not going to give up on that reputation. <laughs> you gotta have something you're proud of. It doesn't have to be a good thing. All right? And then Herbert Scarf comes around and says, Look, let's give up on integers and allow for convexification. Meaning, if you want, you can carry out this activity at a level alpha and this activity at a level one minus alpha for all alphas positive between zero and one, for all alphas between zero and one. If it is between zero and one, it's positive, okay? And therefore, it turns out that you can then get, ah, because we have all of this, right? point here is 1 minus alpha a prime plus alpha a. Correct? So together with it, plus replicability, we fill this whole code. Correct? And then if we do this again here, we also fill in this whole code. Well, what are we doing? We're spanning a production set. Technically, that's what we're doing. We're using convexity 
and reproducibility, replicability, excuse me, to span the production set. But what I care here is that we have also span an isoplant mm -hmm. in a proper sense. Now, notice that I'm cheating. What am I cheating? I'm cheating because in the proper description, you be careful here because the lack of dimensionality. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Remember that these are inputs and these are outputs. And in moving here, I moved also the input, sorry, the output combination. <clears throat> so now you have to use your imagination, normalize. We are familiar with the notion of isoquants because we are familiar with the notion of a single output production function. Right. So in the case, obviously, of a multiple output production function, it becomes a lot more complicated. You can still talk about isoquants, but